there's definitely things to consider in the fall when you're planting. So if you're getting in early, you know, late August, early September, your available cover crop species to pick from is unlimited. I mean, you can use whatever you want and it'll do great. Um, the later you go, you need to kind of figure out how those how those things grow and, and, and start taking them out of your program. Uh, you may need to increase your rate on certain things, you know, to compensate for loss of fall tillering. Um, so it's it's a pretty fluid system. Everybody wants to know what the what the standard mix is or the typical mix, mm -hmm. and that's a loaded question, I think, because it's it's not that simple. I mean, you know, you've got to make the sheet fit the bed. So if you've got a limited budget to work with, you need to identify what your main goal is and, and hit that. We typically don't put legumes in front of soybeans, uh, but we'll have two or three grasses and two or three brassicas. Mm -hmm. You know, we still want the diversity. We just don't need the, the legumes for the nitrogen fixing and things. We may put one in there just for added diversity, but mostly we don't. Mm -hmm. uh, cotton and corn, you know, we'll have two or three legumes to fix as much nitrogen as possible and still have the grasses and, and uh, like for corn, we'll have one grass species because corn is a grass and, you know, there's lots of things to consider, carbon to nitrogen ratios and potential pests overlapping and everybody keeps trying to force it into a, you know, like a, like a cookbook recipe mm -hmm. and that's, that's where people had run into problems. Once we started seeing the potential upside of cover crops other than weed control, uh, you know, the more I learned about it and, and realized how important diversity was, that was the reason we started adding more things to the mix. You know, we were wanting to reduce synthetic fertilizer use, so we, we add legumes to you know, fix nitrogen and, and store for the next crop. We we want to increase our potassium and phosphate cycling, so we we put uh, brassicas and deep-rooted grasses and things to 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 accelerate that, uh, which has allowed us to cut back on fertility. So, you know, just an increase in the health of the soil. We we found that the more things we put in the better things look, the better our soil tests looked, our tissue tests on our plants were better, all while reducing uh, synthetic inputs. Mm -hmm. So it wasn't a premeditated transition, it was kind of reactionary. We, we saw really good stuff with cereal rye. So I did some more research and I found that guys were having good luck with you know cereal rye and radish. So I tried a little bit of that, it looked that much better. So we just kept adding adding things and uh, you know we've planted mixes from one to ten species it just depends on how much we can afford what we're trying to do uh, you know the summer winter we try to the, the more diversity the better is what we've seen when we do the the mixes I'll plant um, everything at the deepest depth required by one of them. Mm -hmm. Like, you know, the cereal rind stuff, you can get inch and a half without any trouble. Mm -hmm. And I found that the smaller stuff like clover that needs to be in a quarter to a half inch will just follow the rye out of the ground. Mm -hmm. So there's no impedance for the clover at those deeper depths. Mm -hmm. You're relying on the grass to get it out of the ground. So planting depth, you know, deeper is usually a little better. better. Yeah. But broadcasting, when I broadcast stuff, I have the best luck with small seeded stuff, real small stuff. You know, winter peas are terrible, but pitch and clover is really good. Uh, grasses are pretty good. Radish is okay. Uh, you know, small stuff yeah. does real good broadcasting. But I don't know. I've, I've had a lot of people fly stuff on and it not come up, and it's again because they didn't ask the right questions or ask the wrong person or, you know, they flew something on that didn't have a chance mm -hmm. because it was the wrong stuff. Mm -hmm. We're chemically terminating, um, 
you know, all the organic guys are crimping and that's fine. The problem that we have with crimping is it's really not effective until those species start to flower. Um, and I, we would like to be planted before that happens. So crimping's not really an effective tool for us. If, if it was, I'd, you know, I'd, I'd definitely use it because that'd be one less chemical pass. There'd be a few more dollars I could put in my pocket. But uh, the timings that we have when we're planting, uh, the plants aren't really susceptible to crimping. Yeah. So the position we're in at the moment, we're, we're killing cover crops from the day we plant to as much as two weeks after planting, you know, after crop emergence. So we feel like the longer we have that living root there while our crop establishes, um, that's the best chance we have for getting a good stand, a, a healthy stand. Um, you know, there's things to look for in that plant also. If you've got a major drought coming up, Maybe you don't want to leave a bunch of green, mm -hmm. you know, cover crop competing with your cash crop. But if it's a big wet forecast and you need to use some excess moisture, it's better to leave it green. Mm -hmm.